Well, everyone, this episode of the podcast is sponsored by I Love Growing Marijuana.com because when you need seeds, nutrients, or a free grower's guide, go over to I Love Growing Marijuana. Right now, they have a special on seeds. Buy 10 Super Skunk Feminized Seeds and get 10 for free. That is at I Love Growing Marijuana. Click on the link in the show notes so that they know we sent you. Also, don't forget that Delta Leaf Labs has that plant DNA sex testing kit that you need. They make it real easy to take a sample from the seedling, and you send that back to the lab. And a couple of days later, you will know whether you've got a male or a female plant on your hands. So go over to DeltaLeafLabs.com, order your testing kits today, and at checkout, use promo code IMGS10 for 10% off. All right, now let's get started. Well, brothers and sisters, this is the In My Grow Show, the podcast dedicated to taking the mystery out of cannabis. I'm your host, Alex, and I want to welcome you to the first episode of 2019. So happy new year, everyone. I hope everybody celebrated safely. I hope everyone had a good time. If I sound a little stuffy or nasally, that's because I'm on the backside of the flu. A good friend of mine came over New Year's Day, gave me a nice big happy new year hug. And then told me, oh, I shouldn't have hugged you. I'm getting over the flu. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. All right. Later on, I'm going to talk a little bit about white flies. I'm also going to talk to Sarah Rotman from Bluebird Farms about how Santa Barbara County is trying to regulate commercial outdoor cannabis cultivation. But first, let's do the strain of the week. Now, for this first review of the year, I'm going to go with the green crack. Now, this is a beautiful variety of sativa, really energizing, a great daytime smoke. It has this just beautiful, flowery, sweet mango, almost pineapple taste and smell to it. I do recommend it if you see it. Now, I'm not a big fan of the name Green Crack because, as Whitney said, crack is whack. But if you do get a chance to pick some up, definitely do so. Not the crack part, the green crack, the flower. Okay, now moving on to what's going on on my social media feed. The 805 Cannabis Society is having its quarterly cannabis workshop and networking event on January 24th from 6 to 8 p.m. Tickets are $15 and it says here drinks and appetizers are included. And it's going to be at the Impact Hub, the State Street location. Never been there, don't know what it looks like. There's going to be a couple of speakers there that night. Amy Steinfeld, who is a land use attorney. And we'll also be hearing from Dan Ackerman, who is a branding and intellectual property attorney. And last but not least, Elijah Spina from Delta Leaf Labs is going to be talking. Now, these events usually sell out, so get your tickets early. You can go to tiny.cc slash canna, that is C-A-N-N-A, to get your tickets. Also, I was over on Facebook today, and I noticed on Sespe Creek Collective's page that they're looking for delivery drivers. And that's all the details I have for that. I'm not on Facebook very often. I'm on there maybe once a week. So who knows when that post went up. But if you're interested in getting into the business of driving for cannabis, go look for some details on uh, Sespe Creek Collective's Facebook page. And finally, my buddy Kristen over at SB Verde had sent me this email. It says, Upcoming Cannabis Lecture in San Inez Valley, January 17th, 2019. It is called Cannabis, Present and Future in Santa Barbara County. Like I said, that's going to be Thursday, January 17th at 7 p.m. at the Bethania Parish Hall, and that is at Adderdag and Laurel in Solvang. The little caption here reads, Our goal is to help you better understand how cannabis is being regulated after legalization in our state. So if you have any questions about how uh, cannabis is moving forward over there in the San Inez Valley or just in the county of Santa Barbara, go check out this little meeting on January 17th. Okay, now moving on to the report from the Cannabis Frontline. On Wednesday, January 9th, 2019, is going to be the end of the nonprofit cannabis collective cooperative dispensary type of business model here in California. Back in 1996, when the Compassionate Use Act was passed, there were a whole bunch of loopholes about how a medical cannabis dispensary could be structured. So people came up with different models of how cannabis patients were going to get their medicine. 
one type of dispensary would have you sign up as a patient and pay them a monthly fee. I don't remember what it was, $300, $400. And that allowed you to come in once a month and pick up one or two ounces of cannabis. The most popular model was you would sign up as a patient with a dispensary, which allowed you to buy the products that they carried. The more patients that that dispensary had signed up, the more products they could carry. And also as a nonprofit, as the name says, the dispensary couldn't make any profit. So after they covered all their overhead, you know, employees, rent, that kind of stuff, any money that was left over, they had to put it back in the community with some kind of outreach program. At least I think I'm remembering the details correctly. I could be totally fucking butchering it because it's been a while since I've had to look in on how it was, how it worked. And I don't own a dispensary. I never have. So, um, so I could be getting a couple of the details wrong. But anyways, that type of dispensary model comes to an end on Wednesday. So those businesses either have to get licensed and switch over to a profit model, close down, or go black market. And this isn't a surprise either. Everybody's known for the whole year that this was going to happen. It's just, you know, the date has now arrived. Next, I want to talk about something else. Um, key cannabis congressional allies have put together the first ever Congressional Cannabis Caucus to develop and promote sensible cannabis policy reform and work to ease the tension between federal and state cannabis laws. So I really encourage you to get your Congress member to join the Cannabis Caucus, and there'll be a link in the show notes in the report from the Cannabis Frontline so you can get more details on that. So let your Congress member know that you want them to be part of this little uh, Cannabis Caucus they're putting together. Also in Massachusetts, State Senator Jason Lewis announced plans to introduce legislation to protect responsible adult cannabis consumers from employment discrimination. Well, that makes it sound like Mr. Lewis is trying to make it so grown adults don't have to worry about having cannabis show up on a drug test at their work. I love that. Also in New Hampshire, legislation is pending HB 350 to expand medical cannabis access. The measure expands the pool of medical professionals who are eligible to recommend medical cannabis by permitting physician assistants to issue recommendations to their patients. Wow, physician assistants, huh? Okay, well, good for New Hampshire. And in Georgia, lawmakers will consider a proposal to expand the fa- to expand and facilitate patients' access to medical cannabidiol CBD products. The pending legislation seeks to establish a regulatory framework to permit the retail sale of medical CBD products to registered patients. I'm seeing more and more of the CBD products in the news. So like that farm bill's taking effect. Speaking of which, Virginia legislation is pending HB 1839 to establish an industrial hemp program that is in compliance with the new federal hemp regulation. The measure expands and amends Virginia's existing hemp law to conform it to provisions of the federal 2018 Farm Bill by amending the definition of cannabidiol oil, that is CBD oil, marijuana, and tetrahydrocannabidiol, which is THC, to exclude industrial hemp that is grown, dealt, or processed in compliance with state or federal law. Looks like Virginia's about to start growing a whole bunch of hemp. And I got most of that information from the normal website. That is normal.org. Go over there, get informed, become a member. I also want to thank my buddy Ryan Cocott for helping me out on some of this. You can find him at Cocott Law on Instagram. He is a cannabis lawyer. Like I said, he helped me out with a few of the details on some of this. All right, so next I want to talk a little bit about white flies in our cannabis gardens. If you remember, I did have an issue with white flies this past season. So I do have some notes. If you go to inmigrow.com and type in the search bar white flies, an article will come up that I also, that's kind of a companion to this uh, section of the podcast. Okay, so white flies are, let me see if I get this right, eroded insects. And I probably didn't say that right. But there are more than 200 species of this type of bug, and it comes in all shapes and sizes and colors. Today we're going to talk about the better known greenhouse white fly which is the third most common pest that cannabis growers run into. Now, the adults look like tiny white moths, and they're really easy to spot if you have any on your plant because you just got to grab your plant and give it a little shake. These tiny little adults come flying out from underneath the bottom of the leaves. And just like spider mites, aphids, and mealybugs, they are suckers, meaning they will suck the life juice out of your plant. 
That's why one of the little telltale signs that you also have white flies are these tiny little yellow dots that you get that they leave. That's where the little larvae and the flies are sucking that life juice out of the leaf of your plant. Now the adults are going to be about two millimeters long, about si about one sixteenth of an inch, and as the name says, are white or whitish, white yellowish. And their bodies are segmented. They have segments. They have three of them: the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The adults have six legs, and of course, white waxy wings that they use to fly off of one infected plant onto another one to infect it. Now the little white flies also lay eggs on the underside of the leaves. The egg stack's usually like a half circle pyramid kind of stack, and also they're kind of whitish, yellowish, and they're not real easy to take off because those egg sacs are attached to the leaf surface with a little hook. So it's kind of hard to blast them away with the hose stream because you wind up just fucking up the plant. And every time they lay eggs, they can lay up to about 150 of them. And they're super tiny, not, micros not microscopic, but really small. I suggest you get some kind of magnifications, like a jeweler's loop. Thir something around 30 to 60 times magnification is good. Now, and the larvae are going to hatch about 4 to 10 days after the, after the eggs are laid. And the larvae have four larvae nymphal stages, they're called. And about six weeks after they hatch, depending on the environment, like the temperature, those little larvae are going to grow into full adults. And those adults are going to live about one to two months. So I'm going to go over the larvae stages, the four stages, real quick. The first stage, the larvae hatches, and it starts to suck on the, the juice of the leaf. That life juice starts to suck it all out. And this is the only stage where the larvae can actually move. In the other three stages... It kind of puts a protective cocoon over it, and it makes it um, stationary. It can't move. But, and I think you pronounce the word is sessile. Now, that's the first stage. In the second stage, it's already in the cocoon. In that cocoon during the second stage, the legs are starting to form. And you can still see the larvae kind of twitching around in there. The third stage, eh, same kind of thing. Not too much has changed. Maybe it's gotten a little bigger. By the fourth stage, the eyes have already started to grow. Once again, it's also gotten a little bigger. And they call this the pupa stage. From here, pretty soon, the full-grown adult's going to come out with, with wings and legs and ready to fly off and infect something else. And I found this cool little illustration from Royal Queen Seeds that I put in the article. It uh, just shows a little white fly life cycle. White flies are one of those pests that really like high temperatures and low relative humidity. That's why they really enjoy the summer months. And that's also why greenhouses, indoor grow rooms, grow boxes, and cabinets are their favorite kind of artificial environment. Because everything's temperature controlled and pretty much at a constant. You know, and they'll usually show up on the weakest plants first. Another reason why they like those artificial environments like greenhouses and grow rooms is because there are very few natural predators for the white flies in there. That's why it's important to make sure that in our grow areas, it's clean and clear of um, any other insects that might eat white fly predators like ants. And I'm going to get into the ants in a little bit. Like I said, one of the first signs of white flies is going to be that little yellow dead spot, that little, it's called chlorisis. And if you don't pay attention to it, if you just let it go, eventually that leaf is going to start to die and dry up starting at the edges. And like I said, if you just let it go, if you don't deal with it, all of these little pests sucking that life juice out of those leaves is going to really slow down that plant. And those things are going to do some real damage to it. Now, white flies usually eat more plant juice than they can digest. And they wind up pooping out what they don't need in this little sweet, sticky liquid known as honeydew. Keep an eye out for the honeydew on the leaves because it will start to grow this black sooty mold on it, which causes a whole other problem because it it gets in the way of the plant's photosynthesis. Another thing that honeydew is going to do, since it's sweet, is attract ants. Basically, what happens is the white flies get bodyguards because the ants will scare off any kind of predator that wants to eat the white flies. But don't worry, there are ways to fight them. First of all, like I said, just make it a habit to look on the underside of the leaves because not just white flies, but other pests like to live there. Also, give your plant a little shake. If there are any adults, they'll go fluttering away and you'll know. There are a couple of soap sprays that you can use, like insecticidal soap sprays or some neem oil sprays. I suggest you use them every 5 to 10 days. So you want to be careful when you use these types of products because they work by dissolving the wax layer of the insect, the cuticle, because once that happens, they dry up and they, they die. Um, so we have to remember the plants have that same type of wax layer on it, just a lot more of it. 
So we just have to be careful not to go too heavy with our mixes or use those type of sprays too often because we could damage the plant. Another thing is that white flies are attracted to the color yellow. That's why they show up on the sickest plant first. And that's why I recommend those lower yellowing leaves at the plant. Just clip them off. There's no need for them. They're not, you know, they're not getting a lot of light. They're already yellow. Just clip them off. They're unhealthy and they attract pests. And that's also why the sticky cards for pests are yellow, is to attract them. Now you can make your own sticky cards by getting a piece of yellow note card and putting some tanglefoot on it. Tanglefoot is um, like a bug adhesive for trees, but you can spread some of that tanglefoot on a yellow card, put that at the, at the base of your plant, and when the card's kind of full, just throw it out and make a new one. You can also tell how healthy your grow room is or your grow area is by how packed that yellow card is. You know, if you have a big infestation, you're going to have a lot of bugs on that yellow card. So they have a couple of uses. Um, something else you could do is you could bring down the temperature in your grow room because white flies don't like cold rooms. You know, bring it below 68. You don't want to do it too long because you don't want to damage the plants either. You don't want to slow them down any more than you have to. But that's just something you could do to kind of slow down an infestation and give you a little bit of room to maneuver. And as always, make sure your grow area is well ventilated because those white flies do like that warm, stagnant air. Just make sure that air is moving around. Any yellow leaves or infected leaves that you do prune off, um, get rid of them right away out of the grow area just so they don't wind up infecting other plants that haven't been infected yet. Now, there are other types of um, organic insecticide chemicals that you can use Well, that are considered organic insecticides. One of them is Rodenon. I've never used it, but I know it's really popular and it's out there. The other ones are Pyrethrum. Now, the pyrethrum I have used in a spray. It also comes in a little fogger can. I've never used the fogger, but I do know people who have, and they swear by them. Same kind of thing with both of these type of products. Um, you know, you want to apply them five to ten days apart. And just a little safety precaution, just like with any kind of chemical, when you're applying it, be safe. Cover up any exposed skin. You know, use a long sleeve shirt. Put shoes on. Don't be in there in shorts and sandals. Put some pants on. Safety goggles and a safety mask. Just be safe. You know, you don't want to be inhaling some of this stuff. It's not good for you. Uh, some other natural ways to think about fighting not just white flies, but other pests is companion planting. Um, now I know some of you are going to say, oh, well, how are you going to companion plant in a grow room or in a greenhouse? You know, and that's a really interesting question. And I was listening to a podcast called Shaping Fire hosted by Shango Los, and he was talking to a guy who does companion plantings in indoor grow rooms. And he has a really cool way of doing it. I don't remember what the guy's name is. If, if you go find the website for the Shaping Fire podcast and just look for companion planting, I'm almost sure that that uh, podcast episode will come up. But he had some really cool ideas about how to do it. But like I was saying, uh, companion planting, if we grow marigolds, Chinese carnations, or basil, that'll help prevent white flies because the smell repels them. They hate it. And if we, and if we plant uh, zinnias and marigolds, next to our cannabis, it really sends a, a foul odor to white flies that they just don't want to be around. Another thing to remember is outdoors, zinnias will also attract natural predators to white flies. You know, they'll help attract hummingbirds and other predator wasps that just love to gobble up white flies. Plants with a minty scent such as hummingbird bush, pineapple sage, and bee balm help to naturally disguise the scent of surrounding plants that attract white flies. All right, and now let's talk a little bit about some biological predators that we can use. There is Encarcia formosa, which is a parasitic wasp, which is really effective in greenhouses and indoor grow areas. They're not harmful to people. They're super, super tiny. They're like one millimeter. They're black in color with some transparent wings. If you're fighting an infestation, using biologicals is good, but I don't recommend that as being your only line of defense for an infestation because biologicals such as these wasps you know they do take a while to get established these wasps what they do is they lay eggs inside the larvae of the white flies and those eggs will grow and kill the larvae from the inside out but like i said if you want some quick results on an infestation only using these parasitic wasps isn't going to do it you may want to think about maybe getting some really hungry ladybugs same kind of thing their biologicals are going to take a little while to really get going we can also use different biological defenses like fungus. The Bavarian bassiana works really well to kill white flies also. And I have to mention again, neem oil spray, maybe even some garlic oil spray really helps control white flies. Another thing I want to mention about the sprays is that white flies can develop resistance to certain sprays. So you want to kind of rotate your applications. 
you know, your first application, you want to maybe give a pyrethrum and then five, 10 days later, give a neem oil treatment. Then five, 10 days later after that, do like a garlic oil treatment, you know, and then alternate back to the pyrethrum just so those little buggers don't get used to what you're throwing at them. Also, another thing about biological predators, you have to make a decision early on whether you're going to fight the pest biologically or with chemicals. Because if you throw in a bunch of biological predators to fight a pest, and then you go in two days later and spray it with a bunch of pyrethrum, you're going to kill a bunch of pests, but you're also going to kill your biological predator. So you're basically wasting your money. So decide early on which way you're going to fight them first. But always have that plan B, plan C, and even a plan D if you need to. All right, well, that's the end of my notes for white flies. Like I said, I wrote an article over at inmygrow.com. If you go into the search, type in white flies, the article will come up. I basically just read it word for word, but if you want to go over there, look at some of the articles that I looked at to put this together from the internet or some of the books that I also looked at to put this together, they're going to be there, and there will be a link from the show notes to that article. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm parched. I think I'm running out of spit. I need to take a break and get something to drink. Um, I'm going to put on some music. After that, I'm going to play a conversation I had with Sarah Rotman, who is the owner of Bluebird Farms, and she is going to talk to me about how Santa Barbara County is dealing with outdoor commercial cannabis cultivation. So hang tight, and I'm going to play that for you in just a moment. And how are you associated with uh, Bluebird Farms? Is that your farm? Uh, that's my farm, yeah. So we own Busy Bees Organics, which is our licensed entity. And then Bluebird 805 is one of our brands. We have two uh, consumer-facing brands where we sell, you know, under our own brand name. Uh, Busy Bees Organics also does a lot of uh, bulk wholesale to other brands. But Bluebird uh, 805 is our brand. And then we also have Busy Bees Farm Flavors, but we haven't really launched that yet. So that's the other one. Okay, so I'm going to give a quick intro. We'll get into the conversation about, you know, what the county's, how the county's trying to regulate or at least control more the uh, commercial cannabis growing. Yeah, I think that, well, okay. Yeah, I, I think that they're, they're trying to sort their way through it. I think the county's actually done a pretty good job, but um, I think that right now the most important thing that we need to do is to educate the public because I think there's a lot more fear than understanding, and it's creating problems in the county. Is the county still trying to limit the size of hoop houses for commercial cultivating? So the concept of hoop houses has been um, still under a lot of a lot of debate, and at the moment it is not uh, segregated to anything different from um, cannabis is not segregated from other commercial crops. However, it has been suggested in the last two planning commission meetings that they do actually make a specific hoop program for cannabis only, and that some people have gone so far as to suggest banning it for cannabis, uh, which would be enormously problematic. Um, and I think they're probably doing that because, you know, the berry farmers appropriately have quite a lot of um, influence in the county because they have really important crops here, and berries really require hoop structures, as does cannabis in certain parts of the county. So North County is where this uh, conversation is. Um, the most heated, and there is another meeting on January 29th in front of the Board of Supervisors where the hoop ordinance is meant to be heard, but up until two meetings ago at the, at the Planning Commission, it was not specific to cannabis. It was a hoop ordinance that simply had heavy implications for cannabis because hoops are such an important tool for us, as they are for a huge number of other crops in the county. You know, I think most of us in cannabis felt that the hoop ordinance thing was sort of a done deal about two months ago. It, it presented itself as a done deal, and I think there was some great compromises made all the way around. Again, the county has been, um, I think, extremely diligent and helpful for the most part in trying to sort through the cannabis uh, ordinance. But, you know, they, they passed one, and, and it is law, and it hasn't even been in effect a year. And now what's happening is the public at large is starting to get notices of permit applications, and I think they just sort of all of a sudden said, holy shit, there's cannabis here, not realizing it's been here for a long time. Right. And now they're, and so I think there's been a very, I've seen a renewed effort to vilify cannabis, 
and so much of it is based on on real lack of understanding of the plant and our practices and what's required for cannabis farmers operating in the legal market. You know, okay. I can't speak for the black market, but I think, sure. unfortunately, what's happening a lot with the public at large is the black market and the legal market are becoming conflated, and a lot of the concerns that I hear voiced in these public hearings tend to be um, the result of bad actors, not sure. the, you know, the number of us who have spent the extraordinary time, effort, and money to try to operate legally. So I think that's what I think is necessary. Those of us who are operating legally or even just as hobbyists, you know, it would be so helpful if we all took the extra time to help educate people who may be neutral on their view of cannabis yeah. and maybe sort of naturally inclined to be negative um, and, and talk to them a little bit about what it is and um, maybe a little bit less less breathlessly, you know what I mean? It's not um, – I think it fits very well into um, – a lot of the things that are important to this county, you know, I think that it's a very farm-to-table point of view. I think that it's a very, you know, organic, friendly, and I think that it's aesthetically friendly. I think it's very sympathetic to the values that a lot of the people I hear complaining about cannabis profess to be aligned with. And I think if they understood more or knew more people that were cannabis-friendly or cannabis users or cannabis advocates, I think they'd be less terrified by what's happening which would be helpful. Yeah, a lot of it is a lack of, not just education, but lack of information, of actual credible Agreed. information out there, you know, yes. because if if we don't have the credible information, then we can't have that dialogue. Then everybody, then, we, then we're all just coming from that place of fear and, you know, imagination Resistance. because, yes. we, you know, because we're imagining these things or, you know, some of the people who are resistant to it are imagining these things. Yes, or they've been given bad information. I mean, in many cases, they're they're completely, you know, otherwise rational, sensible people who are prone to getting good information from reasonable sources, but there's not a lot of information out there, you know, in the normal avenues. I mean, again, if they're not seeking out podcasts like yours, the mainstream information about cannabis is minimal. Yeah. You know, in terms of living in a cannabis farming community, for example. It, it, it is, and with that vacuum, you know, the universe hates a vacuum, so mm -hmm. anybody with any kind of agenda, whether, you know, it be positive or negative for it, can just fill it with whatever information they want. That's right, and I think when and, they're fear-based, that yeah. makes it all the more difficult. And people sure. will take that and say, you know, and they'll repeat it like it's gospel. I yeah, like you said, it's happen, just... And I verified this with some of my other fellow farmers, I've even had that happen at the regulatory level. You know, we had people from Fish and Wildlife who, you know, swore on their professional reputations that, that I needed six gallons of water for every one of my plants. So I was like, if I gave a single what? one of my plants six gallons per watering per day. Yeah. But that was told to me as gospel. How? And that was one of the metrics that they were using to measure my water use. So, And when I showed how? them scientifically how that was impossible, they called me a liar. But how? But I wonder how they came up with that number. I mean, did what Apparently, did they read, or did they just number, pull it out of the air? A, no, I think in, in their defense, it wasn't pulled out of the air. I think it was a fairly obscure um, quote from an article written about by a, an, an environmentalist group that had found that some farmers far up north that were growing, you know, gigantic twelve foot trees had taken oh, a volume of water right at the it. time of harvest that might have been somewhere similar to that, you know, and that then suddenly became the universal metric for all cannabis plants everywhere at all times during the season. And so, it, it, as you say, though, it became this sort of boogeyman factoid that is now, like, actually leading policy, you know, in some cases. And it was just, it's just an example of, and that was, of, of the kind of misinformation that then creates such a problem and, and also creates a lot of ire in the public. You know, if they think we're using that kind of water, of course they're pissed off. You know, that's scary. Yeah. But okay. we're not. So, so just to give a little backstory for everybody, uh, I met you at the 805 Cannabis Society gathering early in December, and I heard you talk for a little bit about how the, how the county, how Santa Barbara County was, you know, like, like I said earlier, trying to limit commercial cannabis grows from the looks of it. And it first came to my attention about this, I don't know, maybe a little more than a month ago, because the county was trying to limit the size of hoop houses. I apologize. My phone just tried to pick up the car. Would you mind repeating that, darling? Oh, just that, um, you know, I became aware of like how the county was trying to limit commercial cannabis by starting to try to limit the size of commercial 
hoop houses for farming. Sure, and I have to say that I think it, it just to, just to um, massage that point a little bit. That's not the county. The county is trying to figure out how to best serve the public, and the public is starting to request that. Yes, the county has suggested an interpretation of the current hoop ordinance, which we believe, um, and many of our attorneys believe, uh, is discordant with the actual law. So right now, uh, it states in the ordinance for hoop houses that hoop houses are agricultural equipment. They are not development, period, full stop. So berry, from berry farmers to cannabis farmers to everyone in between, you know, that maintains our position. County staff has a different interpretation. And it is that interpretation that is at issue. Um, I, I personally don't have enough history in politics to understand how an interpretation can be that divergent from what is the letter of the law, but apparently that's how it operates. So the interpretation is that anything over 4,000 square feet of hoop structure would require a full development permit. Um, well, development permitting process is an extraordinarily lengthy undertaking, extremely expensive, and very challenging to overcome. So now, is that is that 4,000 square feet per acre? No, full stop, per property. Wow, of the full property? In total. So, well, in, for, total. in total. So any, any, right, any applicant or any property that is looking to, yes, that that would be the, the exemption is the would not be, and again, I, I, you'd be better served to talk to an attorney about this, but my understanding um, is that what they are suggesting is that anything above 4,000 square feet would require development. Now, a development plan is, as I said, excuse me, a very lengthy and challenging undertaking that can easily take two years and cost many hundreds of thousands of dollars by the time you do all the necessary reporting. And again, has historically not been necessary so anyone using hoop houses, which are defined as agricultural equipment. So can you help and explain to everybody what a hoop house is? So a hoop house is uh, traditionally what we're talking about is the interconnected um, steel frame structures that are covered in plastic that you see all, you know, especially along the 101 up through Santa Maria, all the way down to Oxnard and Ventura. Um, and they are a source of protection uh, for crops from frost, from marine layer moisture, and also they're a method uh, for us to basically prevent from gusty winds destroying crops, and they help um, mitigate evaporation, and so they allow us to be far more efficient with our water use and uh, more efficient just with all of our crop production, which is a great thing. It enables us to use less land in order to yield the same results. It enables us to use much less water it protects our crops from waste. And in the case of cannabis, it helps to some degree protect from overspray from other farmers who have to labor under much less stringent requirements relative to um, the chemicals that they're allowed to use legally in their crops. So, you know, it protects us from some overspray, and, um, which and is a really big deal when you're a cannabis farmer because we have obviously, you know, requirements that are tested at every phase of our production process. So we simply cannot use a crop that might have been tainted with another farmer's completely legal materials. So, you know, that's just another of the many benefits of hoop houses, but mostly it enables us to extend our growing season to potentially get, you know, two crops rather than just one for those of us who grow in outdoor and growing under hoop houses are, is considered outdoor growing. We are not allowed to use light. So for those members of the public who are concerned about lantern-like, you know, acres of, we're still outdoor. The state does not allow us to use any um, supplemental lighting in hoop houses. It is considered outdoor. It is simply green plants in the dirt, under plastic, farm equipment, full stop. And and if you're familiar with the hoop house too, they're not stationary. They're made to come down and... Yes, they're impermanent structures. And, yeah, in fact, they're... and in fact, um, uh, most of the farmers, <clears throat> in fact, I don't know anybody that keeps them up. We have to take them down in the winter for two reasons. One, and most importantly, because winter storms will probably destroy them. You know, so they're not permanent. They come down every year. We may leave the frames up, but the plastic comes down you know, when the crop comes out. So, you know, right now our hoops that we currently have are down. And, you know, they're impermanent structures. They're mobile, you know. If, again, if you drive, if you take the, the one from, you know, Ventura into Malibu, you know, you'll see hundreds of acres of them and they come down in the winter. And they're not permanent. They, these are impermanent farm equipment. So the big discussion is, of course, you know, 
getting the exemption. Um, and right now, the position that cannabis farmers, and I, I don't mean to speak writ large, but certainly myself and some of the colleagues that I've spoken to about this particular subject, you know, if it's under 16 feet, it is exempt. It is farm equipment. It is not development. It is smaller than a pole barn. There are no rigid sides. Now you're, talking about, permanent. now you're talking about 16 feet in height. Correct. Okay. Yep. So about three meetings ago, that was sort of the consensus that, okay, under 16 feet in height, you know what, it's farm equipment, it's exempt. It went back to the county planning commission to basically, you know, analyze that and, and um, I think come up with language to make that sort of law. And they opened it up to public debate. And I believe, and again, this is complete conjecture on my part, but that is when we saw a lot of people from the community who seem to not be aware that we've been having open public and very, very vigorous debate and discussion on the cannabis ordinance issue in this county for the past two years. And there has been quite a lot of that vilification that we spoke about earlier in this conversation that happened during that process. And that when it was when it was suggested that perhaps we just ban cannabis uh, from being able to use hoop houses. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of the design overlay where they don't want to use <coughs> hoop houses in the view sheds or corridors in the San Inez Valley, up to and including, you know, Buell, between Buellton and Lompoc, where, you know, arguably there's quite a lot of development in Buellton that was not necessarily the most sensitive. Um, so, and, so are they saying they don't want to be able to see the hoop houses from the road? Yes, yes that is exactly the language that they're using. And I don't know how you how uh, can legitimately, I mean, so again, these these seem to me... Um, you know, these are simplistic suggestions that are impossible to to put forth, you know, and it's frustrating to sit in meetings and listen to members of the public who I think are well-intended, um, but then they'll say things like, well, just screen it. Well, I don't know if you've ever driven through Santa Maria, but can you imagine screening those berry crops? Acres and acres. We're talking yes, about, and that's know, how these farmers make a living in Iota. Hundreds of acres. What do these people expect to eat? <laughs> you know? And I understand cannabis is not a food crop, but it is a medicine crop. And, you know, I think um, everyone, we hear a lot of, you know, I, we're, we're so happy that it's here. We voted for it. 64% of Californians overwhelmingly voted to make cannabis legal in this state. And 76% of Santa Barbara residents voted in favor of taxing it and taxing it enormously. And we are looking at a tremendous deficit. We are looking at... Um, you know, disastrous repercussions, and some of which you're seeing now. I think one of the most painful things that brings it into relief, how badly we need this cannabis income, is, you know, what the big discussion that's happening around it, the floods that happened in Montecito. You know, tragically, over 20 Santa Barbara residents lost their lives, and, and they're starting to say that part of that, and again, this isn't me, this is what I've been reading in the paper, you know, was because the, the county didn't have the money to maintain some of those silt, you know, catch basins. That's just an example of the kind of thing cannabis money can bring to the county to help, to, to pay for the first responders, to make sure teachers are well, you know, taken care of, you know, to make sure that our libraries and our schools are funded properly. You know, we are one of the only new sources of revenue the county has. So everybody seems to be in favor of it until we actually are in the process of being able to actually farm. So you think it's that kind of thing of not in my backyard? Yeah, it's great. I just don't want to have to see it. I, I think possibly see it, you know, I think that there's a, a lot of discussion about the odor, which I think is unfair and ill-informed and in some cases true. But, you know, it's certainly no different than, you know, any farm with row crops that has to deal with pesticides or fertilizer has odor associated with it at the time of application. And that is throughout the year. You know, in cannabis, there is a stronger smell at harvest, but that lasts, you know, certainly in the case of Northern County where we are in outdoor environments, you know, that's one week out of the year. You know, I've heard a lot of comments about the dead skunk smell. Well, I also would like to say that we live in an environment where we actually have dead skunks on the road. More often than not, when you smell dead skunk on the highway in a cannabis area, it's probably a dead skunk. Yeah, you know, true. A lot of the people that are, you know, and uh, very bent out of shape about this don't realize they've been living next door to cannabis for a long time, and yet they didn't smell it until they got a development notice in their inbox. And again, it's, it's a lack of knowledge. And, and every agricultural crop comes with its own set of challenges. And we live in an agricultural community. We live near a pig farm. I'm delighted by the pig farm. You know what? The pig farm stinks. 
but it's pigs. And I live in can you know in an agricultural community. We live next door to a composting business. It is actual shit. Like literally, they have five acres of shit on the like next door to our property. Wow, they're worried about. I, I don't get farm. to say anything about that, and wow. I don't want to. They're wonderful people, and they're doing a legal business, and it's perfect. And guess what? I moved into an agricultural community. Fantastic. I don't get to tell them make your make your piles of manure not smell. So and then, I shouldn't. so then, what is it you think the public is missing? I think they're just frightened, and I think that they are. They have a view of cannabis farmers and cannabis users that is antiquated and, and was the result of quite a lot of misinformation that was put forth 20 years ago by some very strong lobbies. And I think I'm grateful that that is now changing. But I think, I think like the conversation where I met you, I think we have to have a lot more meetings where, the, where companies you know, come together and meet people in the business that are actually really operating rather than filling the vacuum, as you say, with with information that's partial, old, antiquated, or inaccurate. You know, I think it's really exciting to see up in Napa and in Sonoma, there's an enormous amount of work being done uh, where, and also in Washington and Oregon, where the wine industry and the cannabis industry are working together. Now, these are industries that share very, very similar customers. You know, we have customers that have, you know, an interest in, you know, land and terroir and an interest in how that affects the agricultural product that we produce and, and the nuance of it. And we have available income to spend on what is ostensibly an expensive product. They're interested in tourism. They're interested in, in being beautiful communities. Cannabis farmers have the same customer, at least certainly the new cannabis farmers. You know, and I think there's a lot of really interesting work being done up north where they have a slightly older tradition. And um, I think it would be wonderful if we could find ways to work together in this county, too, and, and really make that tourism, you know, doubly strong rather than, um, you know, rather than being afraid that we're going to destroy the tourism trade for the other um, businesses here. Do you think it'd be beneficial, like, let's say if we do, let's say, another, you know, networking event, mm -hmm. but invite people who aren't related to cannabis, but can Absolutely. still have those questions? Because I, I think, think that's that'd the be number one, one thing that we need to do. I think that'd be yes. one place where they could. Where, mm -hmm. I think that'd be one place where they can actually meet, like you said, the other side of the cannabis user and the other, yes. and the other side of the cannabis profession. Yes, absolutely. Yes, we should invite restaurateurs. We should invite wineries. We should invite winemakers. We should invite architects and hoteliers, and we should absolutely work hand in hand with these people that we share a community with. And maybe some of their fears are legitimate and we need to know about them so we can address them. And a lot of them are probably just based on old information or bad information and we should help to dispel that too. But wouldn't it be wonderful to work together with them? I mean, if we end up having awesome cannabis tourism, we're going to need to send people to hotels. Already I have people coming and asking me to come, you know, visit my farm regularly. We have restaurants in the community that we, you know, very, very lovingly call sort of like the cannabis cantina because, you know, people go and, and if you look around some of the local restaurants in our community, you're going to see a lot of very, very, very well-intended, successful, diligent, serious, authentic professionals eating expensive meals and, and sharing our tables with other members of the community. And I feel like there is an opportunity for us to really grow and make this a, a really powerful destination for not only the beauty that Santa Barbara offers and the wine that Santa Barbara offers and the beaches that Santa Barbara offers, but also some of the world's finest boutique and um, you know, just gorgeous cannabis products that are all done legally, safely, authentically, and, you know, with an enormous amount of respect for the environment and community with which we live. Yeah. Well, I agree. So, Sarah, how, how can we get involved in helping to Well, know, I think certainly maybe county? adding an... I would love to be able to do an outreach, you know, same type of meeting, an outreach meeting. I think that we need to try to find people that are perhaps not convinced, you know what I mean, but are but are rational in their thoughts because I think um at least open minded enough to where you can come with a conversation. With That's correct. Because a lot yep. of people you know, a lot of people who don't understand or are afraid of it, even an older generation, mm -hmm. they will immediately put up a wall if they even hear the word marijuana or see a marijuana leaf because of That's right the history that's associated with it that we've all just been bombarded with is 
Well, absolutely. But I think that then it's our job to to sit quietly on our hands with our mouths closed and our ears open and listen to their concerns and yeah. see where we can address them. Because yeah, just yeah, fighting isn't going to work. I think to open, just say, hey, what what is your worst fear? Right. Yeah. We can't and just tell those people they're wrong and then move on without really listening. To yeah, them. absolutely. I mean, I know even in the case when I mentioned earlier about the six gallons of water, I was I was actually called to my face a liar. And then instead of getting angry, which I was, <laughs> I you know, I invited. I, yeah, I was I was I was frustrated. And this was by a scientist, you know, which made it even more um, repugnant. But, you know, to I, I was able to get one of the representatives from that government organization to my farm and showed them, you know, our extraordinarily efficient drip irrigation system, showed them the water monitors that we have in the ground that dictate and indicate to us exactly how much moisture we're using, and was able to show them mathematically and without a shadow of a doubt, empirically, this is how much water we use. You know, that's how you change minds. You can't get upset. You can't get angry. And, and she was, and I quote, completely surprised. She's like, I had no idea. And I was like, all of this information was in the report I gave you, but you weren't able to hear it until you came to our farm and met my family and saw our operation and literally saw for yourself. So maybe we need to invite some people to our farms, you know? And I think the wineries do a beautiful job of adopting, you know, customer loyalty and enthusiasm for their brands by having their wine tours and everything. I'm not suggesting we fling open our doors to the public, but I think a few key meetings with people that are the noisiest and the most upset with some of the farms that are, you know, really operating ethically, I think that they might feel comforted, I would hope. You know, that we're not here to ruin the community, but rather we're here to add a lot of value. Am I able, because I don't live in the county, am I able to mm-hmm. write to the city council? and? Absolutely. I think certainly. Do you visit the county? Do you I do. Come and, I do. Are you here as a tourist? Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, yeah. I work in Carpinteria, so is that Santa well, Barbara County? Then you're, well, yeah. then you pay taxes here. So yes, you should write to um, you should write to Doss Williams, who is Carpinteria's county supervisor. You could write certainly an op-ed piece to any one of the local papers. You can absolutely call into red. Yes, you can show up at the meeting on the 29th, and you can say I work in Carpinteria, and part of the reason I do is because I'm really grateful for their openness for cannabis. All of the voices that we need to have need to be made heard because the people that are speaking the loudest right now. Are, are not very many, but they're very noisy, and they know how to operate within the structure of this county government. And if the rest of us don't get caught up, the government will run away from us. And just as democratic process works, if we don't pay attention, we don't get a voice. If we don't get a voice, we will not be protected. Yeah, we have to show up, because if not, they'll just write the laws for us. Well, they uh, are, and they're doing um, it actually, that's... based, and that's what's happening. And the last three meetings, I was, you know, my husband and I were among the only cannabis people there. And it's because we thought it was a done deal. We're so busy working on other stuff, but we can't. So we need to get every single, every single business owner who cares about not being erased because a small minority is frightened of us. And this can be cannabis this week. Next week, it could be, you know, semiconductors. We don't know. But a if small, we allow like, a small group of people to dictate the laws of all of us, then we will always be, you know, unfairly represented. Like you said, it's a small but very vocal people. That's right. You know, and but it works. We, we do need to stand up for cannabis. So mm-hmm. now that city council meeting, when is that? So it is the board of supervisors meeting. So gotta be very careful with your language. Apparently, <laughs> the, county. the board of so supervisor been, meeting. You know, I can edit that out. Board, yeah, and there and that is on January 29th. I don't know exactly when, but if you go to the Santa Barbara uh, government page, which is I think sbcounty.org, and you look at the um, Board of Supervisors meeting that is January 29th, and that is the Hoop House Ordinance meeting. I do not believe this will be the last meeting we need to attend, but I think that what needs to happen is we need to have a large coalition of business owners who are also not just cannabis people. I do think it is more important. I mean, you have a media company. You know, I think I would like to get restaurant owners and hoteliers and all of these other people there that have value in this county to speak up for us. So, and a letter needs to usually be written and you can, um, in advance of that, if you cannot attend the meeting, I encourage you and any of your listeners to get letters in just saying that you feel that, you know, to try to regulate cannabis out of existence vis-a-vis this hoop ordinance thing is, is frankly un-American and it's contrary to the wishes of the public in Santa Barbara. So, you know, certainly I can shoot you an email with some bullet talking points that, that we're working on that we intend to send. And if they are salient and 
relevant to you and you feel comfortable, I think a, a, a written letter uh, 24 hours in advance of that meeting would be very helpful and from as many human beings that live in Santa Barbara County that care about this issue as possible. Again, they don't have to be cannabis people. They just have to care about not having rules written about their businesses by people who know nothing about their businesses. And that's unfortunately what's happening right now. Yeah, if you, and send, then, on a, if, if yeah. you send me those bullet points, I'll put it up on, on the show notes for this episode and I'll have everybody Great. who can and who mm-hmm. wants to just go ahead and copy that up and have them send the letter. Perfect. So, Sarah, can you tell everybody where they can find Bluebird Farms or your products? So, we are Bluebird 805, and um, we are down at People's OC, and we are at Beach Breaks 805 up in Grover Beach. And then, hopefully, we actually met some good people at the meeting the other day. I'm hoping that we'll be able to uh, find our way into a couple of the dispensaries that um, were owned by some of the wonderful folks I met at the meeting when I met you. Now, are you on social media at all? Yeah, we're on, um, we are on Instagram and we are bluebird805ca. That's our handle on Instagram and uh, we don't do Facebook. I just don't like it. But um, yeah, uh, we are. Yeah. And then we are at bluebird805.com. Okay, well, our well mm-hmm. Sarah, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. I really do appreciate this. It was my absolute pleasure. Thank you. And I'll shoot you an email with that information and I really appreciate your time and interest. Yeah, well, don't go anywhere. Okay. Everybody else, I'm going to take a short break and I will be back. Well, mis amigos, my friends, I'm going to call that a show. Again, I want to thank Sarah Rotman for getting on the phone with me and talking to me. You can find her at bluebird805.com. I also want to thank all the artists who let me use their music to put the show together. And of course, I want to thank all of you for listening. Now, if you have a question or a comment about this episode, you can send me an email. That is inmygrow at gmail.com, or you can find me on Instagram at inmygrow. Now, as always, if this podcast has entertained you, educated you, or even given you a little escape from your day, and you're able to help out the show financially, go over to patreon.com slash inmygrowshow and donate a little bit. Or you can go to inmygrow.com, click on the support the show tab and order a t-shirt, or even easier, click on the Amazon link in the show notes before you go shopping. This will let them know that we sent you and the show gets a little bit of commission. Now, if you can't support the show financially, don't worry about it. I get it. But here's how you can help. Tell three other people about the show, subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen, and then go to inmygrow.com and subscribe to the website. Real simple, real easy. And if you're a cannabis company that wants to advertise to our worldwide audience, also email me. That is inmygrow at gmail.com. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and get on out of here. Next week, I'll be back to talk more about pests. Don't forget that I love you all very much. And remember to always grow, learn, and teach. Get some fire!